The woman who lost her memory meets a stranger claiming to be her husband and discovers a life she never knew she had. The first thing I noticed was the smell, a sterile, almost metallic scent that filled my nostrils as I struggled to open my eyes. My head throbbed, a dull ache pounding behind my eyes, making it hard to think. Blinking, I took in the bright, white room around me, the soft beeping of machines echoing in the background. I was in a hospital that much was clear. But why? How did I get here? A door opened, and a nurse entered, her face a mask of professional calm. She smiled gently as she approached my bed, her eyes scanning the machines beside me. You're awake, she said softly, her voice soothing. How are you feeling? I tried to answer, but my throat was dry, and the words came out as a croak. The nurse nodded understandingly and handed me a small cup of water, which I gratefully accepted. After a few sips, I found my voice. Where am I? I asked, my voice shaky. What happened? The nurse's smile faltered slightly, but she quickly regained her composure. You're at Mercy General Hospital, she explained. You were in a car accident a few days ago. You've been unconscious since then. A car accident? I tried to remember, but my mind was blank, a fog clouding my thoughts. Panic rose in my chest, and I felt my hands start to tremble. I don't remember. I whispered, my voice breaking. I don't remember anything. The nurse placed a comforting hand on my arm. It's okay, she assured me. Memory loss can be common after a traumatic event like this. The doctors will be in soon to explain more. For now, just try to rest. I nodded numbly, but my mind was racing. Who was I? What was I doing before the accident? My own name escaped me, slipping through my fingers like sand. I felt like a ghost, lost and disconnected from the world. A soft knock on the door interrupted my spiraling thoughts. I looked up as a man entered the room, his face lighting up when he saw me awake. He was tall, with dark hair and kind eyes, and he wore a look of relief as he approached my bed. Emma, he exclaimed, his voice filled with emotion. Thank God you're awake. I stared at him, trying to place his face, but it was like looking at a stranger. He seemed familiar, but I couldn't grasp how I knew him. Emma? I repeated, tasting the name on my tongue. Is that, is that my name? The man nodded, his expression a mix of relief and worry. Yes, Emma, he said, reaching for my hand. I'm Jack, your husband. Husband. The word sent a jolt through me, and I instinctively pulled my hand away, confusion and fear warring inside me. I don't. I don't remember you. I admitted, my voice barely above a whisper. I don't remember anything. Jack's face fell, but he quickly masked his disappointment with a gentle smile. It's okay, he said, his voice soft. The doctors said this might happen. We can take it slow, all right? I'll help you remember. I nodded hesitantly, my mind still reeling. This man, my husband, seemed kind and patient, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. How could I not remember my own husband? Our life together? The sense of disconnection was overwhelming, like I was watching someone else's life play out in front of me. The doctors arrived shortly after, explaining that the accident had caused a concussion and temporary memory loss. They were optimistic that my memories would return with time, but for now, all I could do was rest and recover. Jack stayed by my side, holding my hand and telling me stories about our life together, trying to jog my memory. He spoke of trips we had taken, friends we knew, the small house we shared on the outskirts of the city. I listened nodding along, but none of it felt real. It was like listening to a story about someone else's life, a life that belonged to a stranger. Jack's voice was soothing, and his presence was comforting, but the nagging feeling of unease wouldn't leave me. That night, as I lay in the hospital bed, Jack asleep in the chair beside me, I stared at the ceiling, my mind churning. Who was I, really? And why did this life Jack described feel so foreign to me? The questions swirled in my mind, unanswered and heavy, as I drifted into a restless sleep, the beeping of the machines a constant reminder of the life I couldn't remember. Two weeks had passed since I woke up in the hospital, and I still felt like a stranger in my own skin. Jack had taken me home, 
a cozy, two-bedroom house on a quiet street. From the outside, it looked like a picture-perfect home with a neat garden and white picket fence. Inside, it was just as Jack had described, the living room filled with framed photographs of us smiling, a kitchen that smelled faintly of vanilla, and a bedroom with a large, comfortable bed we supposedly shared. Despite the familiarity of my surroundings, nothing felt right. I would wake up each morning and look at Jack lying next to me, and the same questions would haunt me. Who am I? How did I end up here? I couldn't shake the feeling that something was missing, like a crucial piece of the puzzle was just out of reach. Jack was kind and attentive, always there to help me with anything I needed. He cooked meals, showed me around the house, and tried to fill in the gaps of my memory with stories about our life together. But the more he told me, the more distant I felt. It was as if I was hearing about someone else's life, someone else's memories. And that gut feeling, the one that told me something was wrong, only grew stronger. One afternoon, while Jack was at work, I decided to explore the house on my own. I wandered through the rooms, touching the furniture, the walls, trying to find some spark of recognition. In the living room, I paused to look at the photos on the mantel. There was one of Jack and me on what looked like a beach, the sun setting behind us as we held each other close. Another showed us at a party, laughing with friends whose faces I didn't recognize. As I stared at the photos, a thought struck me. If these were memories, why didn't I feel anything when I looked at them? Shouldn't they trigger something inside me? A flash of emotion, a hint of the past? But there was nothing, just a cold emptiness. I turned away from the photos and headed down the hall to the bedroom. It was a simple room with a large bed, a dresser, and a closet. I opened the closet door and found it filled with clothes, most of them mine, according to Jack. I touched the fabric of a dress, a soft blue material that felt familiar under my fingers. But even as I held it, no memories came. Frustrated, I turned to leave, but a glint of metal caught my eye. In the corner of the closet, hidden behind a pile of shoes, was a small metal box. It was locked, a simple padlock securing the lid. I knelt down and picked it up, the metal cool against my skin. What could be inside? Why was it locked away? Before I could think it through, I heard the front door open and Jack's voice calling my name. I quickly shoved the box back into the corner and closed the closet door, my heart racing. Jack appeared in the doorway, smiling as he held up a bag of groceries. Hey, I thought I'd surprise you with dinner, he said cheerfully, oblivious to my racing thoughts. I got all your favorites. I forced a smile, my mind still on the locked box. That's great, Jack, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Thanks. As he headed to the kitchen, I followed, my mind spinning. What was in that box? Why was it hidden? And why hadn't Jack mentioned it? My unease grew, the sense that something was wrong becoming impossible to ignore. That night, as Jack slept beside me, I lay awake, my eyes fixed on the ceiling. I couldn't shake the image of the box from my mind, the secrets it might hold. I had to know. I had to find out what Jack was hiding. The next day, I made an excuse to leave the house, telling Jack I needed some fresh air. He seemed hesitant, but he didn't stop me. I walked down the street, my mind racing with thoughts of the box, of the life I couldn't remember. I needed answers, and I was determined to find them. As I wandered, I came across a small cafe, its windows fogged with steam. I stepped inside, the warm scent of coffee and pastries filling the air. I ordered a drink and sat by the window, staring out at the street. The people passing by seemed so normal, going about their lives without a care. Did any of them know what it felt like to be lost? To not know who you were? As I sipped my coffee, a woman approached my table. She was in her fifties, with kind eyes and a friendly smile. Emma? She asked, her voice tinged with surprise. Is that you? I looked up, startled. Do I know you? The woman's smile faltered, and she sat down across from me. It's me, Claire, she said. We used to work together. Don't you remember? I shook my head, feeling a pang of guilt. I'm sorry, I said softly. I don't remember. I was in an accident and I... I lost my memory. Claire's eyes widened in sympathy. Oh, 
Emma, I'm so sorry, she said, reaching across the table to squeeze my hand. I had no idea, but you're with Jack, right? He's taking care of you. I nodded slowly, watching her face for any sign of recognition. Yes, he says he's my husband, but Claire, I don't remember anything about him, about our life. It all feels wrong, like I'm living someone else's life. Claire hesitated, glancing around before leaning in closer. Emma, she said quietly, you have to be careful. Jack, he's not who you think he is. My heart skipped a beat. What do you mean? Claire looked over her shoulder, as if afraid someone might overhear. I don't know all the details, but I heard rumors before the accident. That Jack, he's controlling, obsessive. He was always hovering around you, watching. People said he was too possessive. And then you disappeared, and no one knew where you went. I felt a chill run down my spine. So you're saying Jack lied to me? Claire nodded, her expression grim. I think so. I think he wants to keep you under his control. You have to be careful, Emma. You need to find out the truth. I swallowed hard, my mind reeling with this new information. If what Claire said was true, then Jack had been lying to me all along. But why? What did he want? And what else was he hiding? As I left the cafe, Claire's words echoed in my mind. I needed to find out the truth. I needed to know who I really was. And I needed to do it before it was too late. I couldn't get Claire's words out of my mind. Jack is controlling obsessive. People said he was too possessive. I'd spent hours replaying our conversations in my head, searching for signs, clues that might prove her right. I had so many questions. Why had no one else visited me in the hospital? Why had Jack been so eager to keep me away from everyone we knew? That night, I lay beside Jack, pretending to sleep, my heart racing. His breathing was steady, each rise and fall of his chest a cruel reminder of the truth I might uncover. I had to know what was in that locked box. Whatever secrets it held might be the key to unlocking my past. Carefully, I slipped out of bed and crept towards the closet. Jack stirred, and I froze, holding my breath. When he settled again, I slowly opened the closet door and reached for the box, my hands trembling. The padlock was cold and unyielding in my hands. I needed the key, but where would he keep it? My eyes darted around the room, searching for any place he might hide it. On the nightstand, Jack's wallet lay open, a glimpse of something small and silver peeking out. I held my breath, taking slow, deliberate steps to the nightstand, praying he wouldn't wake up. With a shaking hand, I reached inside the wallet and felt the cool metal of a small key. My heart pounded as I grabbed it and returned to the closet. I inserted the key into the lock, my hands shaking so badly I could barely get it to turn. Finally, it clicked open, and I lifted the lid. Inside was a collection of items, a stack of letters, a small leather-bound journal, and a set of old photographs. My fingers hovered over them, my breath catching in my throat. I picked up the journal and opened it to the first page. Emma's journal. I flipped through the pages, my eyes scanning the handwriting that was undoubtedly mine. But none of it made sense. There were entries about a different life, a different man, someone named Michael. As I read further, the entries became more frantic, the handwriting sloppier, as if I had been in a hurry. June 14th, Michael is leaving. I don't know what to do. I can't stay here without him. Jack has been acting strange, watching me all the time. He says he loves me, but I'm afraid. I need to get away. Michael. I whispered the name to myself, hoping it would spark a memory, but nothing came. Who was he? Why did he leave? And why did I feel a sudden, overwhelming sense of loss? I reached for the stack of letters, my hands trembling. The first one was addressed to me, from someone named Sarah. Emma, I'm so worried about you. You haven't been yourself lately. Jack says everything is fine, but I don't believe him. Please, just tell me what's going on. I'm here for you, no matter what. I barely had time to process the words before a voice broke the silence. Emma, what are you doing? I spun around, clutching the letters to my chest. Jack stood in the doorway, his face a mask of anger and fear. The warm, kind man I thought I knew was gone, 
replaced by someone I didn't recognize. Someone dangerous. What are these? I demanded, my voice shaking. Why didn't you tell me about Michael? About Sarah? Jack's eyes narrowed, and he stepped closer. You weren't supposed to find those, he said, his voice low and controlled. I was protecting you. Protecting me? I shouted, backing away. From what? From the truth? You lied to me, Jack. You told me we were married. You told me we had a life together. Jack reached out to grab my arm, but I pulled away. Emma, listen to me, he said urgently. You don't understand. Michael left you. He didn't want you anymore. I was there for you. I love you. I've always loved you. Tears filled my eyes as I shook my head. No, Jack. This isn't love. This is control. You lied to me. You made me believe in a life that wasn't mine. Jack's face twisted with rage. I did it for you, he shouted. I gave you everything. A home. A life. Everything Michael couldn't. You were mine, Emma. You still are. His words sent a chill down my spine, and I stumbled back, clutching the letters. No, Jack. I don't belong to you. I'm not yours. I'm not anyone's. Jack lunged for me, but I was faster. I bolted from the room, running down the hallway, my heart pounding in my chest. I could hear Jack's footsteps behind me, his voice calling my name. I burst through the front door and into the night, my bare feet slapping against the cold pavement. I didn't know where I was going, only that I had to get away. Away from Jack. Away from the lies. I ran down the empty streets, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I didn't stop until I reached the small town Claire had told me about, the one where people might know me by a different name, the one where my real life was waiting. The town was quiet, the streets deserted, but I found a small inn with a light still on. I stumbled inside, collapsing against the counter, my body shaking. The woman at the desk looked up, startled. Are you okay? She asked, her eyes widening in concern. I shook my head, tears streaming down my face. I need help, I whispered. Please, I need to find someone. Someone who knows who I really am. The woman nodded, her face softening with sympathy. We'll help you she said gently. You're safe here. Safe. The word felt foreign, strange on my tongue. I had been living in fear for so long, trapped in a life that wasn't mine. But now, as I sat in the warmth of the inn, surrounded by strangers, I felt a flicker of hope. I had escaped Jack. I had found the truth. And now I was free. As I drifted off to sleep, Claire's warning echoed in my mind. Jack is not who you think he is. I had seen the truth behind his lies, but I knew he wouldn't let me go that easily. Jack was obsessed, and he would come for me. But I wouldn't let him take me back. Not now, not ever. I was done being his prisoner. I was done being anyone's prisoner. The truth had set me free, and I would do whatever it took to stay free. My name was Emma, and I was ready to fight for my life. The days after I left Jack were a blur. I stayed at the inn, too afraid to leave, too afraid he might find me. I'd been living in constant fear for so long that I barely knew what freedom felt like. Each night I lay awake, waiting for the sound of footsteps outside my door, the sound of Jack's voice calling my name. But the footsteps never came. Jack never came. The truth about him had set me free, but I couldn't shake the feeling that it was only temporary, that at any moment he would find me and drag me back into the life of lies he had constructed. I couldn't let that happen. I needed to figure out who I really was, what my real life was meant to be. I spent my days at the library, poring over public records, trying to piece together the puzzle of my past. I found my name listed in old newspapers, my picture in articles about local events. Each discovery felt like a small victory, a piece of the person I used to be coming back to me. One day, as I sat at a table, surrounded by stacks of papers, a man approached me. He was in his forties, with salt and pepper hair and a kind face. He held out his hand, his eyes filled with recognition. Emma, he said softly, it's been a long time. I stared at him, trying to place his face, but there was nothing. No spark of recognition, no flicker of memory. I'm sorry, I said, 
my voice trembling. I don't remember you. The man smiled gently, understanding. It's okay, he said. My name is Tom. I'm a friend of Michael's. The name hit me like a punch to the gut. Michael. The name I'd found in my journal. The name I'd whispered to myself, hoping to spark a memory. Michael. I repeated, my voice barely above a whisper. Do you know where he is? What happened to him? Tom nodded, his face somber. He left town a few months ago, after you disappeared. He was devastated, Emma. He loved you. When he couldn't find you, he thought the worst. But he didn't know. He didn't know what Jack was capable of. I swallowed hard, my mind reeling. Can you tell me about him? I asked. About us. Tom nodded, pulling up a chair. You and Michael were together for two years. You were happy, but Jack, he was always there, always watching. He was obsessed with you, Emma. He tried to drive a wedge between you and Michael. When Michael got a job offer in another state, you saw it as a way out, a chance to start over. But then you disappeared. No one knew where you went. Until now. Tears filled my eyes as Tom spoke, the pieces of my past slowly falling into place. I had loved Michael, and we had planned to leave, to start a new life together. But Jack had taken that away from me, trapping me in a web of lies and deceit. He had stolen my life, my memories, everything that made me who I was. Is Michael still looking for me? I asked, my voice breaking. Does he know I'm alive? Tom's eyes softened. He never stopped looking, Emma. He's been searching for you ever since you disappeared. If he knew you were here, I nodded, my heart aching with the weight of all I had lost. I need to see him, I said. I need to tell him the truth. I need to make things right. Tom smiled, reaching for his phone. I'll call him, he said. He'll want to know you're okay. As Tom dialed the number, I felt a glimmer of hope. Maybe I could find Michael, and we could start over. Maybe we could have the life we had dreamed of, free from Jack's lies. I wasn't the same person I had been before, but maybe, together, we could find a new beginning. Tom spoke quietly into the phone, his words too soft for me to hear. I watched his face, searching for any sign of recognition, of relief. Finally, he hung up and turned to me, his eyes bright with hope. He's on his way, Tom said. He'll be here soon. I nodded, my heart racing with anticipation. I had spent so long searching for answers, for a way out of the darkness. Now, finally, I could see a light at the end of the tunnel. I could see a future, a life beyond the lies. I spent the next hour pacing the small room, my mind racing with thoughts of what I would say, how I would explain everything. When the door finally opened and Michael stepped inside, I froze, my breath catching in my throat. He looked just as I remembered from the photographs, tall, with dark hair and piercing blue eyes. He stared at me, his face a mix of disbelief and relief. Emma he whispered, his voice breaking. I thought I'd lost you. Tears streamed down my face as I rushed to him, throwing my arms around his neck. I'm so sorry, I sobbed. I'm so sorry for everything. Jack, he lied to me. He took everything from me. I didn't know. I didn't remember. Michael held me close, his arms tight around me, as if afraid to let go. It's okay, he murmured. You're here now. That's all that matters. We stood there, holding each other, the weight of the past slowly lifting. For the first time in what felt like forever, I felt safe. I felt loved. I felt free. In the weeks that followed, Michael and I began to rebuild our lives. We moved to a small town far away from Jack, far away from the lies that had kept us apart. The memories of my past slowly returned, each one a piece of the person I used to be. But I was also different, stronger, more determined to live my life on my own terms. Jack was never found. The police searched, but he had vanished, leaving behind only the wreckage of the life he had tried to create. But I knew he was still out there, somewhere, watching, waiting. And I knew he would come for me again. But I wasn't afraid. I had faced the truth, and I had survived. I had found my way back to myself, and no one could take that away from me. As I stood on the porch of our new home, Michael's arms around me, I looked out at the horizon, 
the sun setting in a blaze of colors. I had been lost, trapped in a life that wasn't mine. But now I was free. I was Emma, and I was ready to live my life, free from the lies, free from the past. I was ready for a new beginning. As Emma stood there, the sun casting a warm glow over her face, she felt a sense of peace wash over her. She had faced the darkness and come out the other side. She had found the truth, and in doing so, she had found herself. For the first time in a long time, Emma knew who she was. She was not defined by her past, by the lies that had been told, but by the strength she had found within herself. She was a survivor, a fighter, and she was ready to face whatever the future held. And as the sun dipped below the horizon, Emma knew that no matter what happened, she would never be lost again. She had found her way home.